Hello, welcome. My name is Patrick Tucker. I am technology editor for Defense One. Uh, thanks to everyone joining us live on YouTube for this program discussing what the war in Ukraine reveals about the future of armed conflict. Before we get started, uh, by means of a disclaimer, please note that the Council is an independent and nonpartisan organization and takes no institutional policy positions. Views expressed by participants on the program are their own. Um, I'm a journalist and I have views that don't reflect those of my uh, employer. Uh, hopefully they make sense, or at least they do to me. But uh, please understand we're gonna have a very free uh, flowing conversation. We definitely want you uh, involved as well. In about 30 minutes or so, we're going to be taking questions from the online audience at ccga.live. So to submit a question, simply enter ccga.live into uh, any web browser and follow the on-screen instructions. With that, uh, I would like to welcome our panelists to the conversation. Joining me today, Mick Ryan, retired as Major General of the Australian Army and is the author of the book, War Transformed, The Future of 21st Century Great Power Competition and Conflict. And Tammy Schultz, the Director of the National Security and uh, National Security and a Professor of Strategic Studies at the US Marine Corps War College. Uh, so thank you both for joining me today. Thanks for having Great to us. be with you, thank you. Yes, um, so first, let's just talk about what's happened since February, uh, everyone's expectations of what the future uh, national security environment would look like uh, have been have been dashed, they've been rewriting them. Some very smart people knew uh, pretty early on that Russia's ambitions in Ukraine were going to be a great deal larger than uh, had been in the past and, and, and that this would upend a lot of people's expectations. Uh, Mick, I think that you were, uh, along with uh, Mike Kaufman over at CNA, Dmitry Oparovich, uh, one of the few folks that uh, understood that uh, Russia was indeed going to make a, a very ambitious play to try and take over Kyiv. Uh, they, they haven't succeeded so far. With all that in mind, um, let's take what's happened since February and First, some lessons learned, the most important takeaways from the conflict so far, uh, and, and particularly what are the opportunities that have been uh, gained and lost from the Ukraine side? Um, I'll, uh, I guess I can start there. The couple of big lessons for me are around strategy and the importance of good strategy and the un underpinning assumptions for strategic thinking. From a Russian perspective, uh, Putin's ideas around taking over Ukraine or his strategy were based on three assumptions. One, that the West wouldn't interfere, would kick up a stink, but not interfere. Two, that Ukraine was not a real country. We saw that in his essay and some of his rambling speeches. And three, the Ukrainian military was the same as it was in 2014, in that it would be not very capable of resisting. You could probably get one of those assumptions wrong, but getting all three uh, has been disastrous. From a Western perspective, uh, strategies of deterrence still matter in the 21st century, and it's not just about nuclear deterrence. How do you deter large, vicious, authoritarian regimes uh, having designs on their neighbours and acting on those designs? I, I think they're really important lessons that come out of this conflict. Okay, Tammy, your lessons learned so far. Yeah, I totally agree, of course, with Mick on assumptions. They need to be reevaluated. So even moving past February, they haven't, in my estimation, uh, been reevaluated. And moreover, you need information to be able to properly evaluate assumptions. And I'm, uh, I think Mick's been clear about this and others. Putin's not getting that information. Um, I think one great opportunity, sort of a, a, a tale that hopefully we will learn from this and take forward, was the Biden administration's incredible use of intel to mm. essentially get in front of the narratives of Putin uh, to, you know, uh, to essentially, you know, the, even when the, the French were saying, no, this isn't going to happen, this isn't going to happen, uh, releasing the intel that it would, um, releasing intel that wasn't intel to sort of caution him about using chemical weapons, uh, just to sort of show him, test the waters, what would happen if he actually did so. Uh, I think uh, that was a very different use of intel than we frankly have seen in the past from the United States. Uh, and I think it was a great opportunity to get in front of what we know is 
one of Putin's big games, which is the disinformation warfare, um, not just within Russia, but within the Ukraine, within our own population, uh, and frankly, within our allies. We were able to control, I believe, the narrative a little better uh, just by speed, frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I definitely second that. Certainly from a, the perspective of a, of a journalist, it was, it was great to be able to uh, point to satellite photos that uh, because U.S. forces weren't operating in Ukraine, um, I could talk about and other uh, outlets could talk about that very clearly showed the buildup on the border uh, that struck directly against the Kremlin's claims. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, some of the narratives that they used to try and, and create persuasive arguments for why this uh, military action was necessary, very easily punctured uh, by repeated efforts from the U.S. and others to, uh, you know, point to those satellite photos, point to what was actually going on, bring out Ukrainian voices, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder, Mick, would you say that, you know, the U.S. and Western allies have actually learned uh, the lessons of hybrid warfare from 2014, when really all of the West was caught so flat-footed by a, uh, a, a Russian invasion of Crimea that uh, seemed to happen really seamlessly, that used these sort of narratives, these sort of false pretenses uh, to great effect. Uh, it seems almost like the reverse has happened. The uh, Russian military looks very clumsy in uh, its very transparent buildup on the border. The pretense is so easily uh, punctured, whereas the U.S., without actually putting personnel in Ukraine, uh, has shown itself to be incredibly effective and a really important uh, partner. So have we learned hybrid warfare between 2014 to now, or we still have something to learn? Yeah, I don't know whether it's a lesson about hybrid warfare, but it's certainly a good lesson about sharing information with allies. I mean, Norman Dixon's old book, Psychology of Military Incompetence, talks about deceiving ourselves. And I think in the lead up to this war, there were a lot of politicians and senior military leaders who deceived themselves into thinking that Russia was way too rational to invade um, Ukraine. Um, why they would think that after thousands of years of history of this kind of behaviour, I don't know, but they did. I think the US intelligence community, to build on Tammy's point, really has played an excellent role here. There were many in the international community who didn't trust the intelligence community, the United States, in the lead up to this war because of Iraq and other reasons. Not saying that's valid, I'm just saying that's how a lot of people think. But in many respects, not only have they played a great role in the lead up to and during this war to preempt Russia, they've reasserted um, their legitimacy and trustworthiness in the international community at exactly the right time, because it will be really, really important as we look to the Pacific and the struggle over Taiwan. Yeah, yeah, I think that... Um a lot of what we're talking about today has pretty direct relevance to the future effort uh, in Taiwan. And today that effort for the U.S. military looks like a deterrence effort. And that's really what they want to emphasize when you talk to mm -hmm. folks at the OPECOM at the Pentagon. Uh, and in order to achieve deterrence, you have a very specific window. And, and Tammy, I want to get to that closer to the end of the discussion because we're going to take the lessons of Ukraine and kind of apply them to Taiwan. Uh, but, but first, uh, what role would you say emerging technology has played so far and has it lived up to its expectations? You know, before February, I would write about uh, drones and artificial intelligence and cyber warfare as though all of these things were going to create uh, terrifying and fantastic new realities. And uh, what we see on the ground in Ukraine is something more of a mixed bag. We see uh, drones being used to tremendous effectiveness. Uh, cyber has played uh, some role, but not the role that I think many people uh, were expecting. Um, artificial intelligence uh, is, is very much sort of in the background, uh, helping analysts with satellite imagery, but uh, not doing something really uh, conspicuous. Autonomy and machine learning, we don't see some of these emerging technologies that many people thought would characterize future war. What role do you see them playing in this conflict? I'll start with you, Tim, because I went to Mick first. Uh, no, not at all. Um, so... In some ways, going back to your hybrid war or what I would call a regular warfare comment, um, I think technology is not going to play the huge, the decisive factor that we, we always assume, I think, in the United States that there is a silver technological bullet, right, that will uh, take out our enemies or help our allies. 
And one of the things I think that this conflict has shown is frankly that time is on the Ukrainian side. It wasn't supposed to be, right? This was supposed to be a fast victory, um, fueled in part by the Russians having better equipment, better technology, you know, outnumbering. So if, if you looked at this purely from a Dominion calculation, right? So Germany versus Clausewitz, right? This should have been Russia's to just sweep up, but it simply wasn't. Um, and so while I think technology has played a role, and frankly, Patrick, you've written more about this, and you should be a panelist on this question because this is your area. Um, I think maybe perhaps most in maybe information in the perception warfare uh, is where we've seen the most gains. And with drones, that was to be expected, machine learning, uh, there's great things happening in terms of being able to categorize in detail the damage that had been done, uh, both for rebuilding, but also for targeting. Uh, so, so that's there, but I think the use of Twitter, the use of social media, the use of trying to control the narrative um, with uh, sort of the information and perception warfare aspect of it. Uh, and, and then, of course, you have the Russians doing what they always do, right? So the Russians have their troll bots they, that are essentially creating these and, and trying to create and flood Twitter with these false narratives. So exactly what we saw, frankly, in our election, we're seeing them try again, like in Ukraine. But the uh, great thing is that, uh, you know, Zelensky basically went from about 30,000 followers to about 5 million overnight. Uh, and who knew you could have a comedian, right, rise up to be such a wartime leader. And so while technology is great, I think the human factor here uh, is actually uh, more important, at least at this moment. Yeah, I, I definitely see that. I was, uh, I think a lot of people have been struck by uh, the effectiveness of uh, the social media campaign from the Ukrainian side. Um, I haven't seen so many uh, tremendous memes come out of a, a conflict, I, I don't think ever. Um, and uh, it, it really sort of reminds uh, both me and I think a lot of other people that um, when the cause is just, it actually does inspire that sort of spontaneous and organic online reaction that we're seeing out of this conflict. But uh, make your thoughts, the role of emerging technologies in the conflict right now. You know, I'll only build on what Tammy said because I totally agree with her. Um, there are no silver bullets in war. There never have been. There never will be. Mm -hmm. um, and it's large, you know, every war is a combination of old stuff and new stuff. It's about continuities and disruptions. I think there's been far more continuity in this war than disruptions, to be quite frank. Uh, the use of autonomous systems, I think, has been rudimentary. It's been used for the reconnaissance strike uh, complex. It's been used to close the detection to destruction gap in, in some respects down to 90 section, se seconds, but often, you know, three to five minutes. So that, that's been useful. I don't think that's new. Um, we've seen the Ukrainians teach us how to have a resilient national telecommunications network, which has underpinned the use of citizen social media and, and journalists to get out what is going on. I think there's some real lessons there in the resilience of national infrastructure um, there's a couple of sites that you can follow that, that look at the availability of Ukrainian internet. It's been around 80 to 90 percent throughout, which has been a stunning uh, uh, achievement. But I think just yes, to build on Tammy's point, the real breakout here has been um, the use of social media. And it's not just the technology, it's, it's the ideas and the organisations in combination with technology that make it powerful. It's been good for mapping. It's been good for real-time updates on the situation. It's been good for both domestic and global influence operations by the Ukrainians, the Americans and others. But it's also been pretty good for almost real-time battle damage assessment, right? Um, you know, any intelligence organisation that's not using social media for real-time battle damage assessment um, are not doing their jobs properly. So I think it's been the real breakout idea, not so much technology of this war, um, and it'll be something that most smart countries will be emulating in the future, if not already. Yeah, and I think it also reinforces something that I, I certainly didn't expect, which is that um, as a military, as a state, your tactics, your the rules of engagement that you live by, uh, they're going to be held to public scrutiny. Uh, and I don't think that a lot of people anticipated that. I think that 
Um, we just in general sort of watching the uh, you know effects of ISIS and how uh, quickly that kind of caught fire among like certain extremist groups and, and, and their tactics were of course barbaric and uh, uh, but sometimes very effective. We sort of assumed that the way that uh, organized disciplined Western militaries do war with rules of engagement with discipline uh, and disciplinary actions for uh, soldiers that, that break those rules. Uh, we sort of thought that maybe that was too genteel to survive the modern moment. And in fact, the modern moment demands that because everyone can watch any conflict all at once all the time. And you're mm -hmm. going to squander your, uh, your sympathy or uh, the will of your audience uh, through bad tactics. And we're, we're seeing that in the uh, handful of cases where uh, Ukrainian forces, where the Ukrainian uh, government has had to say, we've, we've taken the step of disciplining this uh, troop or we're investigating this. And of course, uh, through Russia's actions, where you have just terrible human rights abuses going on, uh, their lack of accountability is, I think, certainly hurting the ability of the Kremlin to begin to persuade uh, even potential allies. So uh, that mm. that's really caused, I think, uh, a, a big shift. And it, it's having effects on the field, I think, as well. Yeah. I think there's this crazy narrative in certain capitals and countries around politically correct military organizations. Um, there's zero evidence for it. I mean, this gentility you talked about doesn't exist. The reason why we have institutional and battle discipline uh, is partly because of those reasons, you know, the strategic influence impacts. But an effective military organisation has to be disciplined so it focuses on the job at hand. When its soldiers are off doing these kind of illegal or stupid or unnecessary things, you're a less effective organisation. So that's why, you know, from day one, values, ethics, discipline are important parts of the training and re-socialization in professional Western military organizations of the United States, Canada, Australia, Britain and others. And it's why it makes us better uh, than the armies of these authoritarian regimes, because it gives us one other thing. It gives us trust that allows us to use um, a decentralized command or mission command which is far more adaptive at every level than the centralised authoritarian ways. So, you know, I, I absolutely reject some of these crazy notions of woke militaries. Uh, we're about good battle and strategic discipline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, uh, Tammy, I want your, your thoughts on that because it speaks directly to, I think, the uh, effectiveness of an NCO core, that uh, ability to have uh, independent units, very small teams that uh, understand the rules of engagement, that understand proper tactics, techniques, and procedures can operate semi-autonomously in sort of an expeditionary way. The U.S. military is moving towards closer to that construct for, uh, for its large formations and uh, contrast that with what we've seen of the Russian military where you have a handful of uh, high authority figures, a lot of um, uh, basically uh, you, you have conscripts in many cases, some of them uh, 19 or, or, or 20 that didn't even know they were going to the front uh, have shown to be incredibly ineffective as a fighting force because of that lack of discipline and because of their inability to operate in small cohesive teams where uh, the person in charge understands what they're doing. Talk a little bit about that and how that represents a future for the US military too. No, absolutely. It's funny, like, you probably should have got two panelists who would disagree with each other more because before Mick said <laughs> mission command, I was thinking this is about mission command, right? So the ability essentially to push decision making down to the lowest enchilant possible. Um, authoritarian governments aren't as good at doing that. Uh, I think the U U.S. military has been doing this for quite a while. So I don't, it sort of seems like, you know, um, new uh, old wine and new bottles, if it were, but there has been an increased emphasis on it, especially with the U.S. Marine Corps, just to speak to that in terms of its sort of vision 2030. And the idea behind that, uh, be it Russia, but I think we've still been sort of myopically focused largely on China, is if you have large weapon systems, if you have huge platforms, those can easily be comprom compromised. They have um, huge signatures, all the rest of it. And frankly, especially if you are arming uh, what is essentially a movement like that in Ukraine, they don't necessarily need the big stuff. Um, what they need is highly mobile weapons that are lethal, um, hopefully at pretty decent ranges, right? So. 
Um, the United States, uh, in, in terms of the Marine Corps, they have essentially gone away, like, you know, getting rid of tanks, for instance, and yeah. deciding to go very mobile, very lethal, with the idea being that if we are stationed anywhere for too long, we just make, it's just a big old target on our back. So the ability to move quickly, but lethally, uh, in order to essentially achieve the objective. And so, but that affects talent, talent management as well, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a whole talent management 2030 for the Marine Corps, whereby we are essentially trying to keep and not, not just NCOs, but also officers in the Corps for longer. And it's the average age of a Marine, I haven't checked this for a bit, but it was around 19, right? So increasing that age, increasing that experience, uh, which then when you essentially push those decisions down the chain of command, you can expect more experience, uh, better decision-making, all the discipline training that Mick referred to earlier is going to come to the fore. So China might be able to, we, we know China is going to outnumber us, right? That's, 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 that's not a, that's not a big secret, but can the quality essentially overcome the quality? And I think that's what we're banking on. Yeah. And uh, so we, we have a little bit of time before we get to audience questions. want to remind everybody to submit those if you have them. Uh, but on, on that note, I think it also shows that, um, in those emerging technologies that we were just talking about, particularly like small drones, small uh, off the shelf commercially available drones. If you have a highly enabled uh, small team that's able to use them to great effect, then, uh, then those tools that are actually really widely available are going to be used as a force multiplier. If you have a force that's badly organized, it's badly disciplined, uh, that operates as sort of like a big mob, then, you know, Russia was, uh, uh, training uh, large battalions on drone use for going back years, and they haven't been used to the same effectiveness. But one of the things that we also see is that um, all of these different things are really effective when you're on a defensive force. These are sort of like guerrilla tactics. And uh, clearly, Russia didn't anticipate the resilience of the Ukrainian military in dealing with uh, their offensive. But now we're beginning to see uh, attacks from Ukrainian forces on very strategic spots in Crimea, uh, military targets that would play a role in uh, reinforcing and resupplying Russian forces closer to Kershaw, et cetera. I and, and other people have been waiting for uh, the sort of fabled Ukrainian counteroffensive to begin in earnest. And lots of people have lots of theories about when that might begin to take place. Uh, but President Zelensky himself has said that the war is going to be over uh, by the end of the year, or he, he predicts it as such. And in order for it to be over, Ukraine has to retake some of this territory that uh, Russia, at tremendous cost, uh, has been able to sort of scrape out. Uh, and launching a counteroffensive is a great deal more difficult than uh, fighting an uh, attacker that's coming in that's badly organized. So, uh, Mick, do you think that the much anticipated uh, counteroffensive is, is in fact afoot right now in Ukraine. And uh, just in general, also, Tammy, to you, what do the next few months of the conflict look like to you? Have we reached a turning point? Um, you know, I think the Ukrainians certainly have been shaping some kind of activity in the South. Uh, it was the high Mars that allowed them to change their tune. They were, in the early days of the war, able to fight a pretty clever conventional fight uh, I, I don't quite agree that they were guerrilla actions. Um, you know, I think the lexicon that's used in the analytical community at the moment is very limited. All they've done is normal conventional uh, tactics where you focus your strength on the enemy's weakness. Um, that's just basic conventional tactics, and that's what the Ukrainians have done extraordinarily well in both close combat and in the deep fight. So um, they were able to do that. They were able to push the Russians away from Kiev and Kharkiv, but they got drawn into... A different attritional fight in the east just because of the geography and a few other unique Russian advantages, like they concentrated all their offensive power and artillery there. HIMARS allowed them to disengage and to get back into how the Ukrainians want to fight, um, which is more about the deep fight, strength against Russian weaknesses. I think they've been shaping the battle space for the last couple of months there. Um, what the operational rather tactical objective is, uh, you know, I wouldn't speculate on, but I think it's more about isolation of the Russian force rather than destruction. 
um, is my sense of things. And I've got a thing coming here today that will talk about that. Um, so I think the Ukrainians are pretty clever. Um, they've, you know, the Russians got the mass, but the Ukrainians got the brains and the heart in this in this war. And I think we'll see something that will surprise people with how they dislocate the Russians operationally in the south. I think that's a great uh, that's a great point, Mick raises. Mick raises, and I think not just sort of dislocating the Russians, but it could very well be a feint. It could be an it could be a reason to essentially move Russian forces to expand, you know, logistic lines to try to. Uh, <laughs> the Russians have shown they're not great at logistics. Uh, basically, uh, try to wear the Russians down. Uh, you asked sort of where you know we might be in a few months. Uh, I, I know what President Zelensky said, but frankly, if this if this thing is over by the end of the year, it means Russia's won, or the Ukraine has given up, in my estimation, uh, a lot of territory that they did not want to give up. I think this is going to unfortunately be a longer drawn out uh, campaign. Um, I think that frankly uh will play to the Ukraine strength. It does not play to Russia's strength. They wanted this to be over and done with. Um, now, the question becomes, you know, said looking forward for the next few months, we have midterm elections coming up in the United States. Does support hold um, after those midterm elections and then coming into January for U.S. support to the U Ukraine? That would be uh, one of the things that I would be looking for. So far, uh, actually, American support, despite higher inflation, uh, assuming that's caused by the Ukraine, which it's obviously not uh, just solely that, or higher gas prices. The numbers are holding that a majority of Americans are willing to sustain that, which I find quite heartening. Uh, so what I would be looking for in the next few months, honestly, uh, isn't just sort of what's going on in the Ukraine uh, in terms of if they're doing you know, true counteroffensives. If they're just trying to uh, make the you know logistical tail of the Russians longer to sort of eat away at it, um, would be partly domestic in the United States uh, in terms of um, can the support uh, be maintained among the population uh, and then also Congress. Yeah. Uh, so in the uh, before we get to audience questions, I want to take everything we've talked about today and then apply it to what many are anticipating will be uh, the. You know, major conflict of the of the next decade, if it were to happen, or hopefully be avoided, uh, and that is the contest over over Taiwan. I know, talking to officials from Indo PACOM a couple of years ago, they were uh, anticipating a window for uh, China to make some sort of military move on Taiwan is between now and 2027. And I'm told by other sources that that's actually very optimistic that the window is much closer to between now and 2024, given the. Uh, timing of Taiwanese elections and, of course, the U.S. presidential election. And that gives the, uh, the U.S. and allies and democracies around the world really very little time to create uh, enough deterrence in order to convince uh, the Chinese government that the costs of a, a military action on Taiwan would be far too high. Um, so we've seen in, in Ukraine tremendous use of asymmetric defensive capabilities. And I, I take your, your point, Mike. It's not... Uh, it's not uh, guerrilla warfare in the, in the traditional sense, but we are seeing uh, some asymmetry. Um, and what I'm told Taiwan must do is, is something similar to create uh, some asymmet uh, asymmetric defensive uh, capability to raise the cost for China. Um, so what are the lessons that China or possibly other autocratic states are taking from the current state of Ukraine and how should the West apply what we've done in Ukraine and what's happening in Ukraine to that deterrence challenge in the next couple of years? Um, I think, you know, having looked at this, I think, and it's the topic of my next book, actually, Taiwan, you know, 2024 is the danger year. I'm, I'm slightly pessimistic uh, that we have seven years to prepare for this. I, I think the warning time is very, very close indeed. Um, 2024, Taiwanese and US presidential elections. The chi Chinese lesson from this is if you can keep the EU and the Americans distracted with something else, that will be very, very helpful. Uh, second, if they can do it quickly before they can turn their attention to it, that would also be very, very helpful. Um, but I also think they know they have a closing window of opportunity. Indo PACOM is getting new capabilities, new warfighting concepts, developing new alliances that really will 
uh, significantly deter the Chinese for an invasion of Taiwan. And, you know, it's a bit harder than just crossing the border like Ukraine, uh, like Russia did with Ukraine. There's 180 kilometres of sea, which is an extraordinarily difficult operational and strategic problem for any military. The US would have problems with this. So even the maths of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan, I don't think they can do this just with blockade. They've got to have boots on the ground because they need a political solution. Uh, this is a very, very difficult problem for them. Tammy, you had the, I know that the, this question of uh, Taiwan and Pacific defense is something that occupies the Marines a lot these days. So uh, your thoughts, can we create asymmetric deterrence in Taiwan? Potentially, I mean, that's what we're trying to do, right? And I think, the situation, honestly, would have been potentially very different, although I, I think the alliance, if you will, which is paper thin between the Chinese and the Russians, uh, let alone how the Chinese would compare themselves to the Russians. But um, I think that it would be a very different situation if Russia had just rolled through Ukraine, honestly. I think um, the people of Taiwan sort of it had a huge sigh of relief when they got when the Russians got held up. I think it made China sort of do a double take. Um, and there's some chatter uh, between the political elite within Taiwan, or sorry, in China. Of course, they've got the second plenary conference coming up, and then the third one in November, right? So all eyes right now for China are just basically on getting President Xi his third unprecedented term. So. In terms of that, I think one of the huge debates this summer uh, and into the fall in China is going to be what to do about Taiwan uh, and when. And I do think that um, while I don't, I, I don't think they're over going to read any lessons from Taiwan or sorry from the Ukraine. Um, I think it does, like I said, it, it's a good news story for Taiwan certainly uh, mm -hmm. that the Russians got held up, and it just shows you don't need a ton of expensive kit necessarily. You need highly mobile kit. Uh, you need a population uh, willing to fight. Uh, those numbers have gone up in Taiwan lately in polling. So if you've got a willing population, you've got allies potentially willing uh, to uh, support you. Although it's mixed raised the point with the water, not only is it gonna be hard for China to get there, it's gonna be hard for the friends to get there, right? So you gotta keep that in mind too. So there's, there's lots of complicating factors, but um, I think that the Taiwanese can get prepared. And, and obviously, Congress is taking this a lot more seriously. So that, that bodes well for them as well. Yeah, let's, uh, uh, let, let's hope that, uh, that that deterrence window is uh, uh, something that everybody rises to um, and that the decision making yeah. turns out to be good. Sorry, make yeah, go Patrick, ahead. can I just say that, you know, the Taiwanese have the intellectual foundations for this asymmetric defense of their nation. I mean, the overall defense concept from 2017 was exactly this. Mm -hmm. It's just that uh, others in the Taiwanese military and government weren't enamored with getting rid of their high prestige platform. So when the chief of defense left in 2019, they got rid of it. Their more recent national defense strategy has embraced a more asymmetric approach. They've embraced reality and they've learned from, and they've seen Ukraine that they actually are going to have to have a more asymmetric approach, not attritional approach, as some of their previous defence leaders would have preferred. So, you know, there's hopes for optimism there that the Taiwanese are really leaning into this problem. Yeah, and of course, there's, uh, we could talk all, all night about uh, Taiwan and, and whether or not uh, there, there are folks in the Taiwanese military that still want to buy uh, F-16s and tanks because they think they're going to drive into Beijing. But there are a lot of people that are with the new defence concept that see its value and uh, you know, there, there are politics in every democracy and in, in Taiwan is certainly one of them. Uh, so let's go to some questions from the audience. Uh, here's one that I think is, is great. Are the economic sanctions likely to impact Russia's military strategy in Ukraine in any significant way? Uh, why or why not? So we, we've seen that Putin is, is pretty secure against the sanctions uh, and he's, he's taken some steps to try and make the Russian economy a little bit more secure, but uh, we know that they are having an effect your thoughts, are the sanctions going to be enough to actually sway strategy of, of Russia? I'll take, I'll take the first shot at it, Mick. I mean, I think absolutely the, um, not just in terms of intelligence uh, warfare and getting ahead of the, the scenario that way in the narrative, I think the way that 
um, the Biden administration, NATO allies have essentially tried to cripple Russia, uh, will have an effect. Uh, it's, 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 Putin is obviously the main decision maker. Um, there's no doubt about that. But uh, as I think you mentioned, Patrick, we've got, you know, conscripts on the ground. We don't have well-paid military. There's a reason for that, right? Um, and some of them don't even know, you know, essentially what they're fighting for. So I think uh, as time goes on, assuming that the allies can keep the economic pressure on Russia and even turn it up and find new ways uh, to make the generals hurt, to make the oligarchs hurt, to make the basic power structure of Russia hurt, there may be slightly more pressure on Putin to do something. Now, that said, I sort of see Putin as Solomon. I think he's going to take the temple down with him. I, I don't see anything really completely changing his calculations, be it economic sanctions or, honestly, even the threat of nuclear warfare. I just, he's just, I, I think... Um, We've seen increasingly as paranoia. Um, so I'm not sure what could change his calculation, and it's his calculation that we would need to change, not the general. Um, but I think we're doing as good of a job as we can with economic sanctions. I don't know what you thought, Nick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, economic sanctions are part of the golf bag of national power that you have to apply in these kind of situations. Um, I think they're probably a medium-term play. They're, they're not something that work overnight. Uh, so it takes domestic and international discipline to stick with it and the coming winter. We'll see how that goes in Europe in particular. Mm -hmm. um, but we, at the same time, I think, as Tammy said, we can't mirror image how Western politicians think on Putin. Um, he is a very different class of fellow. He is, he's far more ruthless. He cares far less about the Russian people because he isn't really answering to them at all. And as we saw during the pandemic, he was happy to underfund pandemic response to upgun his military and uh, give it additional funds so it could undertake the preparation for this invasion. So are economic sanctions important? Absolutely. But they're also part of an overall integrated national and international effort uh, to bring uh, Putin and this invasion to an end. Yeah, I, I just I'm sort of speculating here, but I've, 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 I've speculated on this before. But uh, for any potential rival to Putin, and it's 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 hard to imagine uh, some scenario where that that rival rises to power. But um, just undertaking a handful of policies to bring back some of the money that's been lost to sanctions, reopen up the future of Russia. It's such an easy decision to make to chart a different course away from Putin, and I think he must be uh, at least somewhat aware of that. This. The, the effect of, of this war having uh, pushed really Russian young people uh, off of uh, the international scene. Russia used to be a great destination for uh, contractor software work. Uh, a lot of you might not know it, but uh, there were a lot of Western companies that would contract to Russian companies for, for software design. Uh, and now we see a, an isolated, a highly isolated country and making a decision to open the country back up, see a huge burst in GDP, you can only do that when Putin is gone. And I think he must be aware of that as well as the people around him. But let's go to the, the next question, I think is, is a really uh, great one that I, we can all have maybe an idea on. Uh, can you speak to how the Ukrainian people and government has trained and prepared for this encouraging since uh, the Crimea, the initial uh, invasion occurred in 2014? Um. I can talk to a bit of that. I mean, on the military side, you've seen a very serious effort by NATO since Crimea. Um, in fact, the largest contributor to retraining the, the Ukrainian military was Canada, uh, with major contributions by countries like the United States. That is an incomplete transformation uh, when the war started. Uh, they're still using Soviet equipment and systems, so they're in the, you know, in the midst of transitioning to NATO systems. Uh, more broadly, the Ukrainians learnt to make their national infrastructure more resilient. I talked a little bit about telecommunications infrastructure, um, but you know, there's only so much you can do to defend ports when the Russians have a Black Sea fleet uh, based so close to what they are. So, you know, if I was to to look at Ukrainian preparations for this war, given what they've achieved so far, 
Um, I think they've performed pretty strongly. There's no perfect solution here, of course, and every culture is different. But, you know, I think there are some useful lessons, not just about military strategy, but also national resilience we might take away from what the Ukrainians have done both before and after the invasion began. Yeah, Tammy. I think that was a great answer, and let's uh, do with some more questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, uh, I've covered this a little bit, and, and I think that uh, there must be something to be said for the uh, role that uh, allies, particularly the U.S., has played in, in helping the Ukrainians to both yeah, develop a uh, an IT resilience infrastructure, uh, relying a lot on enterprise cloud, uh, where the assumption is that there will uh, key pieces of infrastructure will be targeted cyber-wise. And so getting those systems back up as quickly as possible. Uh, and of course, working with American SOF, uh, Special Operations Forces, as well as Polish SOF and really SOF forces from all around the world have, have really played, I think, a really large role in helping Ukraine to develop uh, an incredibly capable force. Uh, and you see that playing out in the National Defense Battalions that uh, are able to use kind of the, uh, the tactics and techniques of a, a first great military uh, and partner with the uh, soft communities around the world. And of course, coming out of this conflict, Ukrainian soft operators, uh, I, I think they'll be among the most in demand at any military institution that, that you can pick coming from this experience. Um, yeah, I, I think, Patrick, the focus on soft um, is overdone. Uh, a lot of the training was not done by soft, it was done by conventional forces the large majority of the Ukrainian armed forces that have been fighting this war are conventional and territorial. I think what we've seen has been a realignment of the role of SOF within a larger military force during this war, which I think we didn't see in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they didn't go well. So I think SOF have played a role, uh, but we can't underplay the really major roles by the other 95% of the military forces of Ukraine, including their air defence troops, their air force, and tiny navy in this. I, I don't think we can award the victory to special forces uh, for what the Ukrainians have done so far. Now they right. do a, they do a great job marketing, but <laughs> unfortunately, there's there's the grunts that are doing the work too. But I mean, absolutely, they're they're specially trained uh, for a reason. But absolutely agree um, with Mick. You've got the general purpose forces. Pur the general purpose forces doing the heavy lifting here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess we have time for maybe one more question. The Russians seem to have very large amounts of relatively simple weapons, whereas we are providing more limited stocks, uh, very complex weapons that require extensive training. Do we need stocks of more primitive weapons that can be mass produced and positioned on the battlefield quickly? Uh, I'm not sure I entirely agree with uh, uh, every aspect of that. I think that we're providing really uh, both uh, uh, very primitive weapons as well as some more high-tech things. Uh, uh, certainly we're providing mortars and, and even Soviet era ammo in addition to uh, javelins, which are a bit more high tech and, and, and other things. But uh, it does speak to the kind of high tech and low tech supply needs of the Ukrainian military right now. And, and uh, has that gone in line with what you expected? Sorry, you well, for me, yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so you've got, um, in some ways, uh, President Zelensky, there's a political war here and there's a military war, right? That's why I'm not sure. Uh, I, I wouldn't put a hundred, you know, million dollars on if there's going to be a counteroffensive or if they're trying, like I said, to move Russian forces, a feint, whatever. So the political war, I think, is he has to keep allies on board. He has to show wins, right? Like, hey, your equipment's working. We're like gaining territory. Look, we're rolling back the Russians. We're doing all of this. And then there's the job uh of the military, which in some ways is a little different. Maybe I wouldn't go so far as guerrilla warfare style tactics, but certainly the population is doing a lot of that, um, you know, blowing up um, supply chains and things like that. And so the military is going to be more of a slog, I think, um, than the political folks in terms of the allies, you know, our Congress paying for it. We want to see the quick wins. We want to see how we're helping, et cetera. Um, we're just, it's, it's not going to be as quick as we would like. Um, and so we, we would like that excla the exclamation point uh, coming with high tech or, you know, the like, when the fact of the matter um, that frankly, even some civilians are being trained on is doing a great job. It's just not going to, you know, take back the Donbass overnight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just to get at this high-tech, low-tech, I mean, what we've been giving the Ukrainians is just normal tech. 
Um, they haven't been getting stealth fighters. That's high tech. Javelins aren't high tech. They're just a normal precision weapon that's mass produced and is extraordinarily effective compared to many of the Russian high tech weapons that have very low reliability and low precision. So, you know, I think most of the weapons are normal tech for Western soldiers, sailors and, and, and aviators. Um, and, you know, it's our training systems are designed to prepare our people for a high tech environment. The Ukrainians have shown they are able to absorb these these kinds of weapons very quickly, in some cases even quicker than Western militaries have, for example, a Javelin and HIMARS. Mm -hmm. So I think the problem isn't technological level, it's the different kinds of equipment we're giving them. They have one of every kind of howitzer that's in NATO. Um, Standardisation is going to be more important than technological levels moving forward, I think. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think so. I think so too. And, and uh, you know, it's sort of fascinating the uh, degree of adaptability that you see from the Ukrainian military with many of these weapons where I've heard of uh, Ukrainian forces actually adapting the, the training kit that comes on uh, the Javelin so that they don't wind up losing a round in training so that they can uh, train without losing rounds. Uh, so actually hacking the, the, the system a little bit. But now we're faced with the question of how do we resupply ourselves and uh, as well as that military, as well as potentially the military in Taiwan with uh, mm -hmm. stocks that are are nearing a depletion point. And, and you're right, they are, uh, they may seem sort of uh, high tech because most people haven't used them, but really precision weaponry is a staple of Western militaries. And it's just, if, if you look at the barrage of artillery fire that uh, many places in Ukraine are experiencing, it's not really a staple of the Russian military. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's high tech if, if you feel like it's important, <laughs> but really it's actually just modern warfare. Um, and unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today for uh, all of the questions and all the discussion. Thank you to everyone that, that tuned in and participated. If you missed any part of this conversation or you would like to see the program again, it'll be available for playback on the Council's website uh, and social media channels shortly. Uh, and with that, please join me in thanking our distinguished panel of experts for being on the program today. It's a great pleasure uh, to speak to all of you. And, and, and thanks again. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks.